From London, I'm Rochelle Travers, and this is The Standard. There's been another day of violent disorder in the UK, and there are fears that the far-right protests could be heading to London. A list circulating on social media, which suggests that extremists are planning protests in four London boroughs, is currently being assessed by the Metropolitan Police. It includes a series of possible locations for demonstrations around the country, as well as Harrow, Hounslow, Finchley and Walthamstow in the capital. MPs and local councils for the area have posted on social media asking locals to stay calm and reassuring the public that safety is their top priority. I'm now joined by Nicholas Cecil, The Standard's political editor. Nick, what do we know so far about these potential far-right protests heading to London? So news of these possible protests started to emerge on Monday afternoon. And this was a, a list going round on social media. And it seemed very much to be by a far-right group or, or far-right uh, individuals. It included a few dozen possible locations for protests around the country, including four in London, and they're in uh, Harrow, Hounslow, Walthamstow and, and Barnet. In all these areas, the local MPs or the local council have confirmed that they're speaking with the police about these possible protests or raising concerns with the other authorities, for example, with City Hall. So some patrols, extra police patrols, have already been put on in these areas and the, the police have been gathering as much intelligence as possible to work out how likely any protest really is. Because there's certainly a concern among some MPs that um, once these possible protests become known, that you get counter protests and that can actually turn violent as well. So everyone is trying to treat these possible protests as sensitively as possible uh, to avoid risking inflaming any situation. The government says it's planning on fast-tracking justice against thugs involved in these violent demonstrations. How will that work exactly? Yes, well, at the moment, the courts are sitting in normal times. A number of cases are now flowing through the courts of people who are charged with public disorder and other offences. And the government's aim is very much to get the criminal justice system working as quickly as possible to get these cases through the courts and get people jailed for for rioting. And the the aim there is basically to make it very clear to people that if you go out there on the streets and you start attacking people or causing fires or other public disorder, then you're going to end up in jail. And some of these individuals could face long jail terms. So we had, for example, the courts minister, Heidi Alexander, on the radio this morning saying that in some cases people could face up to 10 years in jail. And what we've seen in in the past with with these public disorder rioting incidents, events, is that the courts come down very harshly on offenders because they want to stamp it out. So for for people thinking of going out there and taking part in in riots, they should think very, very carefully because um, they could end up in jail for a number of years. Social media has played a damaging role in these far-right protests, largely through the spreading of misinformation. And now ex-owner Elon Musk has sparked a huge backlash over comments he's made. Just explain what's happened there. He he responded to someone suggesting that the riots were were linked to an open immigration, open borders immigration policy. And he suggested that civil war is the inevitable consequence of that. And... Yesterday on Monday, Downing Street criticised his comments. And then he has criticised Sir Keir Starmer, who made a comment on Twitter that Britain was taking all these steps to stamp down on the Raz and stressing that basically the government would not tolerate violence against Muslims and, and mosques. And Elon Musk said, shouldn't you be talking about all communities? And we had the courts minister again, Heidi Alexander, back on the media around this morning, and she again criticised him and basically saying people shouldn't try to be stirring up trouble. They should be, everyone should be trying to appeal for calm at the moment. So there's quite a lot of anger in government about Elon Musk's comments and also about the failure by social media companies to do more to tackle disinformation on their platforms because certainly part of this violence is blamed on misinformation which went out about these Southport stabbings 
claiming that they were carried out by a Syrian asylum seeker who'd come across a channel on a small boat and was being watched by the intelligence and security services, which is just plain untrue. Do you think these protests are likely to die down anytime soon? I suspect that they will die down. Two things that could bring about that them starting to peter out. The first is, is rain. If it rains, people don't go out in the streets. It's as simple as that. In hot weather, people tend to drink more and often go out in the streets, and that can turn violent. At the moment, the forecast is actually there's still a number of sunny days ahead. But the other thing which I think will gradually have an impact is people will realise, they'll pick up from the media, that more and more people are going to jail for these public disorder offences, and then they'll think twice about going out on the street to cause trouble. That may take a, a few more days, possibly even a couple of weeks to play out. But I suspect sooner or later people will realise that actually going out on the streets to act in a thuggish way and often racist way, basically you can land in jail rather than going on your summer holidays. Let's go to the ads. Coming up in part two... It hasn't meant a huge boost in sports for most of us. I think it probably has meant that we're better at the Olympics ever since then. The Standard's Robbie Griffiths analyses the legacy of the London 2012 Olympics. Did it deliver? Welcome back. Now, unless you've been living under a rock for the past week or so, then you'll be aware we're currently in the midst of the Paris Olympics. Team GB is doing us proud with plenty of medals and hopefully more to come, fingers crossed. But when watching the events, many of us can't help but reminisce about the excitement and joy of the London 2012 Olympics. So much so that The Standard's feature writer and editor, Robbie Griffiths, has taken a little trip down memory lane and has analysed whether or not the city delivered on the Olympic legacy we were promised all those years ago. I kind of started looking into this because we were hearing so much about how much Paris was getting cleaned up by the their Olympics. So they cleaned up the, the river so that people can swim in it and they invested a lot in the metro system and they built a few different venues and they're hoping that their Olympic village would become housing and kind of reminded me back of the Olympics in London all those years ago and whether it's it changed London for the better and when I looked into it I found basically as with everything positives and negative I started out looking at the most obvious thing which is what are the venues that were built for the London uh, Olympics being used for and as we most of us know the Olympic Stadium is now West Ham Football Club Stadium. So but there was a lot of argument and uh, upgrades that happens before that but now that's how it is and then there's a bike track out there there's a handball arena which is kind of used for a lot of things, including video games competitions um a swimming center which is the aquatic center and there's other venues out there but on the other things the results were i guess less impressive at times particularly in housing when the olympics was won uh, in the mid-noughties by london the idea was that going to be huge that newham was going to get regenerated out in east london and there would be forty thousand new homes huge number of which would be affordable However, particularly the Guardian newspaper did some good research into how many homes were were built and it was only around 11,000. Only 11% of those they estimated two years ago were genuinely affordable people there. So while some of them were useful, uh, not all of them were. And for example, the Athletes Village, there were new towers built on the site of that, which they said were going to be publicly owned and some would be affordable. But actually what happened was that they were sold and the taxpayer lost about 275 million pound on them and then they had some of them had turned out they had cladding on them a bit like grenfell tower which has left the people that did buy them unable to sell them robbie you've also been looking into other areas too such as transport and sports funding have they had a better legacy um some yes so basically i didn't want to be completely negative i think the transport system was it expanded the particularly trains for the london 2012 so the overground there was a whole new section of it was built not entirely for the olympics but around that time so it went from surrey keys to clapham junction via peckham that expansion was really sped up by the olympics i think and then other train lines like uh, the dlr and particular train lines between king's cross and, and stratford during the olympics were created but the thing that people remember is, is this cable car between Greenwich and the Royal Docks, um, which Boris Johnson was connected with in that he kind of used to boast about how over 2,000 people an hour would be able to travel on it. And it cost about 60 million to build. Yeah. But actually, 
it's not something that has become a key part of London's transport infrastructure. And at one point, a Freedom of Information request showed that it was only used by four regular commuters. And how about sports funding? I was interested in this because you think of London and uh, obviously London 2012 did it, did all the money just go to London. That wasn't the idea at the time. The idea at the time was that it would also boost sports participation around the UK. So there would be money thrown into the sports funding and then lots of new people would, would play sports. But it's very hard to do that, it seems. And actually, in the years after the Olympics, despite us all being, being very excited when Mo Farah and Jess Ennis won their medals, uh, the proportion of adults participating in sport at least once a week actually fell in the UK soon after that, despite lots of millions and millions of pounds being spent. So they tried to change how they were spending that money and refocus the cash. But that didn't work either, it seems, because there was a report by, um, by the, in the Parliament last year which tried to work out where the 1.5 billion of grants distributed by Sports England had been spent since 2016. And actually only about a third of that did they actually know where it had even been spent um, and little progress had been made tackling inequalities and the barriers to participation in sports. So it's a mixed picture, really. I think I try not to be too negative, but I think it's very hard to direct these, this money, it seems, and they have, they have necessarily it hasn't meant a huge boost in sports for most of us. I think it probably has meant that we're better at the Olympics ever since then. We've won more gold and up. We, at this Olympics, we're, doing another, we're having another great year. Now we're in the midst of the Paris Olympics currently. What challenges will they face when it comes to their own Olympic legacy, do you think? I think that's a really good question. I think, I suppose it's easy to promise things, isn't it? So I think we saw that with cleaning of the Seine and the river. We all felt quite jealous and we thought, wow, they've spent all that money cleaning at the river and it's worked and people can swim in it. But already during the Olympics, it wasn't ready and they had to delay the triathlon. French people are very angry that billions of euros have been spent cleaning it up. And so it's all very well to do it for the Olympics and boost the cash. But if it costs them millions a year to keep it clean, will they want to do that? And it will also, I think, keeping promises. So they promise that 30% of the Olympic village in uh, the northern quarter of Saint-Denis in Paris will be public housing. Similar promises were made to Londoners about how much would be public housing of the Olympic village here. And really what happens is that we haven't seen that. And so I think the promises are impressive. I think things that you can get built and then stay built. So transport infrastructure, that's great. But anything where you're going to have to keep in, investing in it, it's very difficult to keep promises. And I think that's probably where Parisians will get angry in a few years when they realise, oh, actually, maybe we can't swim in the Seine unless we spend huge sums cleaning it every year again. You can read more about these stories and others in the Standard newspaper or on our website, standard.co.uk. And that's it from this episode. The Standard Podcast will be back tomorrow at 4pm.